Hello and welcome everyone to Capital Trends. My name is Joshi and I'll be joined by my good friend Chaitan. Hey Chaitan. Hey Joshi. In today's episode, we'll be talking about blockchain. For easier understanding, we have divided the whole episode in four main headings. What is blockchain? How blockchain works? Business case applications of blockchain? And most importantly, how an average retail investor can understand and invest around blockchain. So Chaitan, what do you think is exactly blockchain? There is a lot of buzzword around this thing. Yeah, so blockchain is one of the biggest tech buzzwords these days. So you can imagine um, blockchain is like a database, but but it's not like a traditional database, especially the way data is structured. In blockchain, the data is stored as signed blocks with links to each other. So it's a different concept altogether to imagine. If you had to imagine what a blockchain is, I think the easiest way to do is just let's go back to one of the analogy that I really liked. Would be very exciting if you can explain this as an example format, which would be really great for our listeners. Yeah, so let's imagine ourselves in a medieval age. By medieval age, you mean Westeros. <laughs> yeah, so we are in a village called Perth. There are 10 families living here. There are a few people who are hunters, farmers, fishermen, and so on. How do they exchange their commodity? A farmer will give a fisherman some of his produce and fisherman some of his fish. This works great. However, every now and then what happens is the fisherman can't catch a fish. So he promises the farmer that he will give extra fish the next time. It works fine as they trust each other. But obviously when it comes to dispute, you cannot really solve that easily. So in order to solve this, this issue, the village decided to nominate a person or an institution of authority to keep that record. Fantastic, problem solved. Uh, the nominated person or the ledgerman kept track of every exchange. But what if that person is dishonest and doesn't obey the rules of transaction? Absolutely. As he became greedier and corrupt, started taking bribes, or this ledgerman started charging fees to manage the record keeping, the village lost trust in the system. So that's a problem right there. So what's the solution for this? Does blockchain solve this problem? Let's see. So the villagers decided, instead of one person holding the ledger, now all of us will keep the ledger. So they decided a time of the day, everyone would meet at the village square and write down every promise made. So every week, they would validate against each other by one person reading all the entries and the other person confirming those. If there are no discrepancies, that means they had consensus. So basically what happens is, instead of that central authority, now that information is distributed, it's decentralized among the participants. What it means is though, all participants need to be updated when this information is exchanged. And what happens if there is discrepancy between the fisherman and farmer? We don't need to worry about whether to trust the fisherman or farmer. The information that is across majority people's ledger is the correct information. So how this, um, see how this system eliminates the middleman and his fees and ability to corrupt the system. Blockchain is similar to our village system, just a tad bit sophisticated, complicated and run by computers. Quite an example there Chaitan. So I've heard that blockchain sits on top of the internet. There are a few facts that I'm in hearing which I would like to elaborate. One is Nasdaq, which we all know is a very big exchange facilitator in New York, is working with Chain.com to validate the transaction processed in blockchain. I've also heard that blockchain is now where the internet was in 1993. There are words like smart contract, decentralized finance, abbreviated as DeFi, could you enlighten us more about them? Yeah, so first thing, smart contract is not as smart as it sounds. Smart contracts are programs stored in blockchain that run when predetermined conditions are met. So basically, it doesn't need a third party intervention. A blockchain executes that contract on its own. Just to give you an example, what could happen is imagine there is a shipment going around and when a shipment is delivered, you automatically get that payment for, for that shipment. This can be used in so many other applications like when a condition is met, we can release the funds to the appropriate parties, register a vehicle, sending notifications or issuing a ticket. Whoa, the business case applications of such a technology could literally be a game changer. The most basic application I can think of is setting up a business-to-business -business private blockchain 
for internal transaction without an intermediary decimating the transaction cost, isn't it? If we dig into the history of digital blockchain, the whole idea was evolved around vehement anthema towards big trusted financial institutions who were in a broad sense responsible for participating in unabated growth of financial excess of 2008, which ended with what we all call GFC of 2008. Huge reputed players like Lehman Brothers, big banks, insurance and reinsurance companies went belly up. The ripple effect was devastating. People lost their life savings, pretty much their livelihood. Yes, yeah, so Satoshi Nakamoto, the person or the persons who developed Bitcoin, had written a post. Here are a couple of lines from that. So what he said was, the root problem with conventional currencies is all the trust that's required to make it work and the central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency. But the history of fiat currency is full of breaches of that trust. It's quite a profound thought, uh, which probably formed the basis of invention of cryptocurrencies. Quite recently, Bitcoin, or especially excessive energy usage for mining around Bitcoin, has come under a lot of scrutiny. The farmers are mostly set up in those parts of the world where energy is cheap and heavily subsidized by local government like China or Texas. We hear that Bitcoin mining consumes as much energy as the whole Netherlands uses in one year. Something to ponder. When we talk about power, electricity, there are always questions about fossil fuel and climate change. Our famous guy, Mr. Elon Musk, initially got the idea of buying Tesla cars with Bitcoin. But ironically, <laughs> the idea of Tesla being an electric car maker and Bitcoin a net climate annihilator, he had dropped the idea. Do you know whether he is back to it? Uh, probably. They will accept bitcoins again, but I don't think they have started it yet. In the blockchain world, or especially in the community working in bitcoin mining industry, do they have an answer to this big climate question post? Correct. That's a really interesting question. Thanks for asking that, Zoshi. So, in order to really get anywhere near to answering this question, what we would have to first understand are the two concepts within uh, mining. One is proof of work and the other is proof of stake. So let's just dive into what a proof of work is. It is a decentralized consensus mechanism that requires members of a network to expand some effort in solving arbitrary mathematical puzzles to prevent anybody from gaming the system. So the closest way to imagine this is similar to the actual gold mining. One thing is for sure, we are surrounded by gold mines. We are in Western Australia. Do not forget that, mate. <laughs> exactly. And if you segregate all those external factors, what determines how much gold you end up getting? It is the amount of effort you put into mining, right? So proof of work is quite similar to that. It is how much computational power you end up giving to mining in order to mine a block. So the network is growing. It is facing more and more difficulties. The algorithms need more and more hash power to solve that mathematical puzzle. Miners with high computational power equated to high graphic processing units or gaming computer usage. No wonder why NVIDIA, the largest maker of GPU listed in US, have a skyrocketing stock. It's up about 1600% since last 5 years as of today. Yeah, I can imagine. There are Bitcoin mining farms that have popped around the world. They need cheap electricity, they use customized mining machines that are specifically designed for Bitcoin mining and good network connectivity. After utilizing all the resources, once you solve this puzzle, you get blocks as a reward for solving those cryptographic puzzles. So this is the very concept that has come under scanner. Yeah, absolutely. This is very contentious topic these days. Some estimates suggest that a single Bitcoin transaction uses the same amount of power that the average American household consumes in a month. So what's an alternative for that? We went through what is proof of work. The other concept is proof of stake. In proof of stake, a person can validate the blocks of transactions and the validation capacity depends on the stake they have within the network. So most importantly, the validators do not receive the block rewards. They actually receive transaction fees. So in proof of work, if you remember, you actually received a block reward as part of mining it. Whereas in here, the validators receive a transaction fee as reward. 
So this dramatically reduces the amount of computational power needed to get the system working. So let's summarize and add a few things here. Since blockchain is an evolving technology, we can confer analogically old Nokia phone to Bitcoin, a mere first generation smartphone to Ethereum, an iPhone 12 or 13 to Ethereum 2 launching in Jan 2022, Cardano, etc. Each eliminating problems which previous technology had. Blockchain can be subclassified into many entities broadly, but for practical purposes and ease of understanding, we will classify them as public blockchain, which can be assessed by anyone. Examples of which we all know goes by the likes of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, and private blockchains, which can only be assessed by predetermined entities, be it a group of people or institutions. The examples of which are Hyperledger, R3 Corda, Corom. Mind you, private blockchain can be programmed to be partly decentralized, meaning there could still be some authority calling shots, but doesn't have a lot of power to change the system completely. That's really interesting. You can see how rapidly the blockchain has evolved. As I said, blockchain as a whole is a very much evolving concept. Okay, fantastic. Now that we have covered what a blockchain is, how blockchain works, let's move on to our next segment. What's the business case application of a blockchain? So Joshi, can you help us talk through the business case use case? I've been hearing that the venture capitalists have poured in nearly $17 billion of capital this year into companies that operate in this space. And from what we have learned in the previous segments, blockchain works on decentralized concepts. So how do we build an economy around these concepts? Look, the blockchain concepts were framed with utter dislike towards gatekeepers of capitalism and a way to bypass them, which includes financial lawyers, underwriters, accountants, exchanges, money lending banks. They make up a huge economy by themselves. So say for instance, I have a business and if I have to go to public market to raise a capital, I'm bound to go through this middleman and use their services while floating an IPO, which is initial public offering, offering a share of my business and give part ownership to the people in exchange for money. But in the utopian world of blockchain, we can cut through these middlemen and raise our money directly to the people by ICO, which is initial coin offering by offering similar part ownership in businesses, but in token form, which can be tra traded, exchanged, transacted, and can also be used as a digital currency wherever accepted. The value of these tokens or coins will depend on demand and supply, which ideally should depend on how the underlying business is performing. Technically, these altcoins are full-fledged business platforms whose increased usage for smart contracts or building DeFi or decentralized finance apps is considered a successful value-adding phenomenon. So what you're saying is we can use something like crowdfunding to start a new cryptocurrency and IPO. Absolutely, Shetan. And that is exactly where I'm going. Even the big guns like Goldman Sachs, which is big underwriting bank, NYC, one of the biggest stock exchanges in the world, aren't oblivious to the seismic shift happening with blockchain. So they themselves have become the investors in these technologies. I think both have invested in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Have you heard about recently about El Salvador, whose economy is a bit of a doldrum? They have bought 550 Bitcoins and also approved Bitcoin as an official tender currency. In a very home in Australia, our Senator Andrew Bragg introduced a bill which says people who are mining cryptocurrency using renewable power entirely will get 10% discount of their taxes. Although mining being going back to proof of work concept mostly used in Bitcoin, but still I would consider it as an olive branch from politicians to blockchain industry. That's fantastic the way you have explained how businesses can evolve around the concept of blockchain. And true to that, I've heard that IBM has a massive team of around 1600 plus team members working on blockchain products. IBM and similar companies are putting quite a bit of heft 
behind blockchain by reimagining businesses. So what are the companies that we know of that are invested into blockchain? There are many evolving businesses in blockchain space. There is a social media platform called Akasha coming to Facebook. Ah, you mean Meta? <laughs> yep, Meta it is. They have already started trading with that name. Other names are Stem.io, Cinero. There is a one called Open Bazaar, which is similar to eBay or Amazon. There is Lazuz or Arcade City, which is Uber-like services. Kodak One, which is digital ledger of photographs. As you can see, there are businesses fully operational within blockchain space, being fully decentralized and eliminating the need for any governmental or corporate authority for exchange in the services and value. This is the last and most important part of our podcast. So everyone, train your eyes and ears to this segment. Just ears are fine as this is not a video podcast. <laughs> um, we know blockchain has potential to have profound impact on our investment strategies. So Joshi, can an average retail investor like you and me decipher these trends to navigate all the jargons that we hear day in and day out so we can utilize this information for our investment goals? Can we do that? Yeah, definitely. So for easier understanding, let's divide this into three easy to understand segments. Number one is ETF. Number two is cryptocurrency, which I'm sure many will be excited to hear about. And number three is NFT. Let's start with ETF here. In our home in Australia, we have one ETF, which is working in this space. Its sure name is BetaShares with ticker symbol CRYP which holds businesses like Marathon Digital, Galaxy Digital, Silvergate Capital, Hut8, Hive Blockchain Technologies. These are the businesses who are either involved directly into blockchain mining or providing financial services towards digital currency industry. As you know, Security and Exchange Commission as of today doesn't classify Bitcoin as a security. But due to high demand, they have given permission to trade Bitcoin futures. There were two huge launches a couple of weeks ago and many more in the pipeline. One is by ProShares called ProShares Bitcoin Strategy, ticker symbol BITO, with 1 billion in asset under management. The other one is by Valkari called Valkari Bitcoin Strategy with ticker symbol BTF, with 40 million asset under management. In fact, BITO made a record of fastest growth of asset under management, something like 1 billion in 48 hours. Whoa! So essentially, Bitcoin futures will allow investors to speculate on the future prices of Bitcoin without having a Bitcoin. <laughs> and so these are related to Bitcoins or other digital currencies. Do you have any ETFs that have a broader exposure towards blockchain? Trading on NYSE, there is an ETF called Amplified Transformational Data Sharing with the ticker symbol BLOK with pretty much same holdings as what we have here in Australia with asset under management close to $1.4 billion. Then there is one by ETF Securities in Australia with the ticker symbol FTEC which have a broad exposure to crypto miners as well as data providers like Faxet and Monistar Plus the digital wallet and trading platform like Coinbase. This is great if you want to have direct exposure to blockchain and Bitcoin. What about people who might have lesser capacity to digest this volatility around blockchains and Bitcoins? What can they do? Blockchain space is extremely volatile. We can sometimes see 30 to 40% gyrations in either directions. To avoid that and still dip your feet in this space, we can buy stock of traditional businesses who either are working in payment processing industry, incorporating cryptocurrencies or have cryptocurrencies heavily added to their balance sheets. But their main source of income is broad. Example, Microsoft, PayPal, Square are some of the big names. Yeah, even Tesla ended up having a $1.5 billion uh, of Bitcoin stashed with them. Absolutely. So if you hold Tesla, you have already dipped into blockchain space. Okay, that's a great way to traditionally invest in blockchain. What about non-traditional way? Or what about someone who has a higher capacity to digest a risk? Do you want to take them through how we can invest in cryptocurrencies? There's a lot of exuberance around cryptocurrencies, so I'm pretty sure our listeners are keen to listen more about them. All the way along, in this cryptocurrency field, I have seen that there are three kinds of investors. First one is a speculator who just goes and opens a Coindesk account and starts trading the cryptocurrencies. 
especially those that guide it frequently, making money pocketing the differences. The second ones are learned, informed investors who understand what is happening behind these cryptocurrencies, especially the altcoins, which are born after crypt Bitcoin, like Ethereum, Cardano, Polkadot, and how products are being developed with the help of these platforms. The use case of these platforms and then betting on them and profiting eventually as the usage of these platform increases. Finally, there are third kind who are software guys like you who can actually work on these platforms, building decentralized apps or NFT or using these platforms to develop actual tangible digital product or services. Perfect. That would be a dream job for me. So there is something for every type of investor in the crypto space. So I'll summarize the top three cryptocurrencies by their market cap. Obviously, the crown goes to Bitcoin, which is right now, as we talk about, is about $1.2 trillion odd in market cap. Second is Ethereum with a four fifty billion odd dollars and the third one is Cardano which is sixty nine billion dollars. Apart from these there are many others being launched as research progresses and new services are imagined eliminating the glitches which older ones have. Cool. So Bitcoin is the first generation crypto based on proof of work concept. Ethereum is transitioning from proof of work to proof of stake and Cardano is the third generation proof of stake based blockchain. You mentioned something about altcoins. Can you explain to our listeners a little bit more on altcoins? Yeah, altcoins are cryptocurrencies that were developed after Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not a platform. It's just a plain cryptocurrency which can be used to store and exchange value between two individuals or entities. For simplification purpose, you can compare Bitcoin to gold or the gold still have some physical usage, but since eternity, it was considered as an excellent value storage medium. Yeah, I think we should highlight some examples of altcoins. So the most popular one, which has jumped 900 or percent since the year is Ethereum. There is Ethereum 2.0 that will be launched in Jan. There is Ripple going by symbol XRP. There is Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, Cardano, Polkadot, and many, many more. Nice. There seems to be quite a few bit altcoins out there. Which ones are interesting? Yep, there are. My personal favorite is Cardano because it was developed by the same guy who was amongst the founding members of Ethereum, a guy named Charles Hoskinson. He had some kind of disagreement with Ethereum board members. He, along with some other people, some famous mathematicians, ingenious cryptography experts and many others, they came together and started Cardano which basically eliminates all the problems which Ethereum have on its platform, moving away from proof of work to proof of stake. Then there is another one called Polkadot, which basically has interoperability among blockchains. There are some who have a very utopian idea of competing with Amazon or Netflix, delivering content from user to consumer over a decentralized platform. Cool. So moving on to the third part of the investment case um, was NFT. But before we dive into how to invest into NFT, can you please explain to our listeners what is NFT? NFT is such a hot topic currently. It promises to revolutionize the art industry and beyond. NFT simply stands for non-fungible tokens. In order to understand NFT, you should understand what exactly is fungibility. Fungibility in simple terms means exchangeability or replaceability. For instance, I have five bill, five dollar bill. It will be replaced by another $5 bill or two $2 coins and a $1 coin. So $5 bill is considered a fungible token. I have an ordinary watch which is mass produced. It's still classified as a fungible token. But if I have a limited edition Rolex produced only once and it will no longer be designed in the same way or no same parts will ever be used in cons it's considered non fungible. In simple terms, one of its kind, with what we understood that $50 bill is fungible token, $100 as well, Bitcoin as well, but limited edition Ferrari produced and driven by Enzo Ferrari himself is non-fungible. Yeah, so there are various platforms that you can use to create an NFT on different blockchains. It has come a long way since uh, such a short time. Non-fungible token in cryptocurrency is a single digital token which cannot be replaced by something of exactly same value. Cool. So how can an average investor invest in any of these? 
So what I see around investing in NFTs, there are two ways which I can think of. One is you should be a digital art creator or a content creator where you can create digital music, digital cartoons, short film, full length cinema, create your content and sell it as NFT. Or you could be a plain investor where you can value a particular art that is created as NFT deed. Buy that exactly like any of your asset, wait till it appreciates and then offload it at higher price pocketing the difference. That's very well explained. Now that we know NFTs, what are some of the recent examples of NFTs? And mind you, every day you hear about more and more people joining the NFT bandwagon. So there are many famous examples of NFTs. One is by our very own Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, who sold his first tweet for about $2.9 million. Then there is a very famous artist who goes by the trade name Beeple. He sold his art, which he calls the first 5,000 days, for $69 million. Then there is a very famous guy named Tim Berners-Lee, who is Alan Turing Award winner, a professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He sold his first source code as NFT. He's the guy who created the internet. Nice. So we can sell our first podcast on NFT as well. <laughs> For sure. Then there is another category where you can be a digital art collector. Someone by the trade name Matt Khan, based in Singapore, is amongst one of them. Collecting expensive digital arts as NFT. Nowadays, you will hear big sporting bodies like Cricket Australia, International Cricket Council, NBA, with their top shot rights protected videos every year being sold as NFT. Players with their best catch, best six or best four, best bowl video or best reaction will fall into this category where once owned by someone that video cannot be used without giving royalty to art holder which will be automatically registered as NFT is a type of smart contract. To summarize the last section of podcast, we cover different ways to invest in blockchain world from trading cryptos to investing in developing businesses around blockchain. And if you are an art buff, you can explore NFTs as well. On that note, it's time to wrap up. Joshi, it's been really fun today and looking forward to our next episode. Likewise, Chetan. Likewise. Ciao. This recording is for informational purposes only and does not constitute an investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date recorded, opinions are subject to change. Capital Trends Media shall not be responsible for trading decisions, damages or a loss resulted from or related to information, data analysis or opinions expressed on this podcast. Past performance does not guarantee the future results. All investments are subject to market risk including potential loss of principal. Please read product disclosure statement before investing into any product. We are not professional financial advisors. Do not take investment or financial advice from our podcast. Always consult a professional financial planner regarding advice that suits your individual needs which you can find on ASIC, APRA website in Australia.